a warning before you start this episode you might want to get some creams or whatever because you might get so much stupid exposure that you get like some first degree stupidity burns on your brain from what you're going to have to listen to. Well hello again, it's Christy and it's Friday so you must be here to catch up on atheist and secular news from last week. Our first story is going to be another face palm moment. Christian columnist rips Sanders' anti-poverty plan the God of the Bible is not a socialist. Christian columnist Chris Queen argued that Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders' anti-poverty proposals went against biblical teachings because the, quote, God of the Bible is not a socialist, unquote. Sanders had urged Christians at Liberty University to apply the golden rule and do unto others what you would have them do unto you and apply that to public policy. Queen asserted in a column that Sanders' plan to bolster the social safety net was wrong because biblical teachings only apply to people, not governments. He opined, God's commands are not to enact government programs to take care of the poor and destitute. Rather, he commands his people to take care of each other and enact justice as individuals and families and bodies of believers acting on their own obedience to him, he added. The Bible's only acceptable form of government is monarchy. And yet I don't see Christians advocating the overthrow of a representative democracy in order to align ourselves perfectly with what is in the Bible. And clearly the idea that somehow a Bible written for monarchs, and if you look at the instructions, I, I looked at the passage where it was David speaking to Solomon. It says, keep all, the God, keep all of God's commandments. David is saying that to Solomon. And part of that is showing charity. So um, basically, this is another example of Christians picking and choosing what parts of the Bible they want to follow. And in particular, they don't want to follow any of those parts that would require them giving up money to help poor people. They want to decide for themselves who deserves uh, their help. Whereas the point of a government is that your citizenship alone qualifies you for participation in the social safety net. Because at some point we all might need the social safety net. And we shouldn't have to rely, we shouldn't have to be enslaved to people's uh, whims as to whether or not we should be helped or not. It's anti-equality, it's anti-humanism, it's anti-compassion to say that you can pick and choose. Uh, and that's the only form we can have. So. Christians not understanding their own texts once again. What a surprise. Atheist wins Jesus sign battle. Woo! Is that like a rap battle, but like with gang signs or sign language or maybe just random gestures? Georgia school district will remove poster, stop graduation prayers. The Rayburn County School District in Tiger, Georgia has agreed to discontinue Christian prayers at graduation ceremonies and remove a sign containing the name Jesus from public school property. Are we not living in the 21st century? I really, until I started doing this show, had no idea how pervasive this problem was. And literally every single week. It's not just one case here and one case there. Every week so far, if you've noticed, there have been multiple storylines going on, in particularly in the South, but not that's not always the case, where people, Christians are attempting to use their Christian privilege to deny others basic rights and, and equality and to insert their religion into public places. And it's really, really uh, shocking to me the amount of, of this assault on the First Amendment that we're seeing. The district agreed in writing earlier this week to stop having Rayburn County Elementary School Principal Lisa Patterson. Elementary schools! They're doing this at the age to indoctrinate children. That is the whole point. Ugh. Lisa Patterson to give Christian prayers at public school graduation ceremonies and to remove the sign with Jesus' name on it. These actions came at the demand of the American Humanist Association's Apignani Humanist Legal Center, who sent a letter of complaint to the school district in early September. Monica Miller, senior counsel for the Humanist League Center and author of the letter, said that the staff-led prayers at public school events are blatantly unconstitutional. And one more story about Christian privilege being pushed back. And this one comes from The Blaze, the Glenn Beck thing, and uh, it's there's very few things sort of like as rewarding for me on this show and on YouTube when I get to take right-wing news articles and 
give it the complete opposite spin that they meant it to be taken in. The other thing that I really like is when I go to watch The Bible Reloaded or other shows on YouTube and the ad comes up and it's offering a free Bible. And I just love the fact that people who are making Bibles are giving money to The Bible Reloaded to do their atheist Bible study. But getting back to The Blaze. City Council's unanimous decision after Fuhrer over Christian-only prayer proposal. The Coolidge City Council, which had previously voted 4-2 to two to allow Christian-only invocations, was widely criticized over claims that the policy violated last year's Greece versus Galloway Supreme Court decision, which affirmed prayer at public meetings so long as every faith can participate. The city faced legal threats in recent days from the American Civil Liberties Union and the Americans United for Separation of Church and State and decided to hold a special meeting to address the issue. It was there that officials instead voted to allow any and all religious groups into the fold to pray before council meetings began. I would hope that a humanist group would uh, petition the city council in order to lead a humanist non-prayer, a moment of science instead of perhaps a moment of silence, where some basic information on the age of the earth or the theory of evolution could be read out uh, so people could contemplate it. I hope somebody takes that idea and runs with it. Na 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 dick moves! Orthodox Jewish State School bans TV and internet from pupils' homes and tells parents to dress modestly. An Orthodox Jewish faith school instructed pupils' parents not to wear bright clothing, to cover their elbows and knees, and to refrain from following the trends which contradict the spirit of modesty. The policy states that mothers' dresses and skirts may not be shorter than four inches below the knees and stresses that the knees must remain covered at all times. Because we all know all those knee fetish magazines that are out there and how guys can't talk to you because they're so busy checking out your kneecaps. It adds that a slit in the skirt or dress is absolutely forbidden, even if it is completely below the knee. The policy also forbids parents from wearing flashy or brightly colored clothing and says that trendy fabrics are related to the casual free way of life in the street color culture and are not permitted. You can go ahead and read the whole article, but this is just to me uh, totalitarianism. The idea that in order for your child to go to their school, the parents have to have a dress code. And this to me is just um, an overreach of the greatest proportion. That the school, your school could be dictating your clothing lifestyle and the idea that if you violate it, your child will be punished. If I am, a, as a mother, go out and someone busts me because I happen to have a skirt with a slit in the back that I didn't know, you know, for when I was walking. Let's say there's a, like a quarter or like a few inches near the ankle so that when I, my stride goes, I can actually walk. And my, my child should get busted out of school because I wore a skirt that had a slit in it below the knee. What a little bullshit. Our heroes at the National Secular Society have written to the Department for Education and Office of the School's adjudicator raising concerns about the school's failure to respect pupils' individual liberty. Their campaign's manager, Stephen Evans, said, quote, The school is not just limiting its austere and restrictive religious practices to the school day, but insisting on them in pupils' homes as well. Thank you, National Secular Society, and when more stories on this come up, if I see them, I will certainly keep you updated as to how this is progressing. Ben Carson, a president's faith matters, so Muslims should be disqualified. Carson was asked, should a president's faith matter? He replied, I guess it depends on what that faith is. If it is inconsistent to the values and principles of America, then of course it should matter. Todd, uh, Chuck Todd Preston, do you believe that Islam is consistent with the Constitution? Carson quickly replied, no, I do not. I would not advocate that we put a Muslim in charge of this nation. I absolutely would not, unquote. Although he did go on to say that voting for a Muslim to re represent people in Congress would be a different matter. I'm not going to go through the usual stuff you've probably already seen about the Sixth Amendment or the six, Article Six of the Constitution and and all the religious tests and all that kind of stuff. That's not what I wanted to point out. I don't mind people having stupid opinions as long as they apply that stupid opinion consistently. And the fact is that if you look at the text of the New Testament, it views the American Revolution as um, an abomination against God, as defying the will of God. In fact, the entire existence of America, since its foundation, is goes against the Bible. And let me show you the passage. From Romans 13, 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. If by looking at this passage, you can see that the American Revolution itself is anti-biblical. It goes against God. It, and, and Christians themselves should not be willing to participate in something. They should be calling for the monarchy because it that was what was established by God. So, you know, Ben Carson doesn't even understand his own text well enough to see that his faith is actually incompatible with the existence of the American government entirely. And that if he was a true Bible-believing Christian, he should be following the Queen of England. Hey, did you know about this? Here are some stories that you might want to check out. I'm not going to say a whole lot about them, I'm just going to introduce them because I don't want this video to go like 25 minutes. And if you're interested in what you're seeing, you can always click on the links in the description box below. I'm a blogger. I am threatened by Islamic extremists, so I have to flee Bangladesh. Adam Anupam, an atheist blogger, goes public with his fears after writing for several websites and social media. He's saying that Europe and the developed world are much safer for intellectuals who denounce religious fanaticism. And the arrest of extremists in his country is just smoke and mirrors because the government does not want to lose Muslim votes. In a related story, ask right questions in secular Islamic debate on country's identity, lawyer says. This story is about Malaysia, where there's a debate about what kind of nation it is and according to the author and according to the attorney Malaysians should be asking whether the country is based on democratic or theocratic principles rather than debating if it is a secular or Islamic state. The human rights lawyer said only then other questions on issues of secularism could be answered. Quote, the real question Malaysians should be asking is if Malaysia practices democracy or theocracy. The next story might not seem related to religion in a direct way, so let me preface it by saying my personal issue that I like to really raise when I see it is the impact of religious patriarchy, the way that women and children are seen as being less than males, and that structure being based on violence and fear and submission, and how unhealthy I think it is, and where I would like to move everyone is to uh, a more secular position where we all have our humanity in common and that's what connects us and we all start off as equals. A symptom of that religious patriarchy, whether it's in Christianity or Judaism or in, in Islam, manifests in many ways and Child Brides is one of the ways I see it manifesting. Child Brides photo series proves girls are simply too young to wed. When Mejgan was 11 years old, her father sold her to a married 60-year-old Afghanistan man for two boxes of heroin. In my whole life, I've never felt loved, she said, after enduring years of abuse. Every year, 14.2 million girls are forced to marry before they turn 18, a damaging tradition that disproportionately affects poor girls and leaves them more susceptible to abuse, poverty, and death due to childbirth and other health complications. Sinclair felt emboldened to continue her photo initiative, which has now evolved into Too Young to Wed series, a campaign that aims to raise awareness and funds girls who are trapped in the cycle of child marriage. What about religious freedom for the secular? This opinion piece by Edwina Rogers, CEO of Secular Policy Institute, is not brilliant, but it's not bad. My criticism of this piece is very particular. The subtitle says why we need to amend the First Amendment, and she goes on to say, We need to protect scientific and rational-minded U.S. citizens who do not enjoy the same rights as religious individuals under the current stipulations of the First Amendment. Our amendments need further amending. And she makes a, you know, a nice case in her article. What she fails to do is say what that language would look like. <laughs> Where would it go in the Constitution? Um, you know, how would it be applied? Would it maybe be discrimination um, you know, in, in other amendments or is it in the First Amendment? So I think it's interesting. It, I'm flagging it up and you can have a look, but I'm not going to recommend it as a really good piece of writing because I found a, a major flaw with it, but you can form your own opinions. A Black Woman's Case for Atheism. Despite being among the most religiously or churched groups in the nation, there are compelling reasons for black women to be attracted to atheism. 
The stigma of public morality fueled by white supremacy and patriarchy has always come down more heavily on black women. Religious right policies cutting reproductive health care disproportionately affect poor and working class black women. Yet the most visible version of public atheism is that of superstar heretic Richard Dawkins and his acolytes. The association of atheism with whiteness and white culture tradition is one of the reasons black feminist atheism is an anomaly. There is virtually no space for it in black culture, much less academia. Aside from my books and that of writer Candace Gorham, there has been little published on black women and non-belief. Atheist slash humanist scholarship is still dominated by white males who naturally have a far more institutional acceptance than the few people of color in the field. I raise this issue because I always think it's important to listen to people's own voices and to raise them up and empower them. And I think as a secular community, a humanist community, this is an issue that we need to be sensitized to and work on solving. I know from my own preliminary research into people's stories of deconverting from Christianity into atheism that black American atheists who've gone through that process discuss feeling alienated from their the entirety of black culture in a way that white respondents don't. So white respondents will maybe feel alienated from their, de their denomination. Um, but in terms of the black community, what people in their stories talk about is the fact that the language, the discourse itself, is bound up with Christianity. So, you know, you need Jesus and he's got the devil in him. And everything being explained in a Christian paradigm makes it that much more alienating when people uh, in the African-American community step away from that and disassociate themselves because atheism is very much associated with whiteness and white culture. And I think this is an important issue if we want to move forward as an integrated movement that empowers people, then listening to other people's sides of the stories and taking that on is quite important. Hey, that's going to wrap up this episode for this week. You can check out, I've been doing a lot of other stuff on politics too. I've got a video on Scott Walker, why he got out of the race, why I think Donald Trump could make it to the nomination process, at least I plied it out through South Carolina. And I'm also going to be doing a video on who supports Trump and why I don't think his supporters are going to leave him anytime soon. That I'm hoping to do over the weekend. So um, until the next time we meet up, I've been Christy, you've been awesome, thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video, and remember, any story that you've watched in this episode, if you want to learn more, just go below to the description box where all of the links will be provided. See you guys later, and have a good weekend! Bye!